Now we're going to be speaking this morning, if the Lord will allow, on the presence of God. Yes. The presence of God. There's nothing like it. Amen. There's nothing like the presence of God. I could feel the presence of God so strong in this place this morning. As I could hear you singing and, and, and worshiping, I was back there in the office praying and I said, God, let your glory cloud fall. God, let your glory cloud fall in your house today, God. And I stood back there a little longer than, than normal because I felt the presence of God. Do you know that when you stand in the presence of God, nothing matters. Nothing else matters. When you're standing in the presence of God, the, the worries and the, the mountains and the struggles that you're facing don't seem so big anymore because now you're focusing on the presence of God. You're focusing on the one who can solve the problem. You're focusing on the one who has the power and authority to change your season and your circumstance. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus chapter 40. And we're going to start at verse 34. Exodus 40 and 34, it says, Then... A cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. It says, then. See, then. Then. Then, then. then. then means after the obedience of Moses. Because before that, before this scripture, it talks about how God spoke to Moses how to build up the tabernacle. He spoke to him in detail how to build up and set up the tabernacle. And it was only after Moses obeyed everything, every detail that God had commanded of the tabernacle. It said, then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. See, it's after your obedience to God will he cover you with the glory cloud. It's only after you do it God's way that then he will release what is in his hands. Amen. In, in the, the previous scriptures, it talks about the anointing, how Moses, God, God dealt with Moses to anoint the tabernacle. He, he, he told Moses, you are to anoint the altars. You are to anoint everything inside of the tabernacle. Why? Because it is holy. Yeah. And if God's house is holy, what has happened to it? Then people wonder, why has the glory of the Lord departed? Because places of worship, not all of them, but places of worship are no longer holy anymore. They're no longer filled with the presence of the Almighty God. And we wonder what happened to these places. Are they not the house of the Lord? Just because, I said it before, just because you have church outside on your on your. Uh, sign does not make you a house of God. It is, it, God said, my house will be a house of prayer. Yes. It will be holy. Amen. And God directed Moses, go through and anoint everything. What did we do after we stepped into this building? We went to the four corners of this building. Lot. We went to the four corners of this building. We we anointed. We we prayed. We marched around this place. I don't know how many times, laying our hands and saying, "God, we anoint this place. This is your house. 
this is not man's house, this is your house. Then we came inside and we laid our hands on all the instruments. We laid our hands on the altar. We laid our hands on the podium. We went and laid our hands on each and every chair, every window, every door, every exit, every entrance, every chair in the Sunday school room, every every chair and table in the fellowship hall. Yes. Amen. Why? Because this place is should be a place where it is holy. Because it says then, after Moses did everything that God had dealt with him to do concerning the tabernacle, the house of God, then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. Wasn't it last week or so that I said, when God moves, we move. But when God stays, we stay. Verse 37, but if the cloud were not taken up, then they journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud, verse 38, for the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. See, there's something to be said about the cloud of the, the Lord, the glory cloud of the Lord. And the, it, it, it shone in the tabernacle by day and the fire by night. The cloud by day. I said, Lord, send your glory cloud in. Let it, let it rest upon your house this day. And tonight, send your fire. Send your cloud by day and send your fire by night. Yes. God led the children of Israel by a cloud in Exodus 14. It said, and by a cloud in the daytime and fire by night. Yes. And I began to think about that. God, your presence, your very presence was with the children of Israel in the wilderness. It led them. By a cloud during the daytime. Why did they need the presence of God? They were already free from Egypt. Because we need God more and more every single day of our lives. The children of Israel needed God's direction. And he led them by a cloud during the day. And by night, he led them by a, a pillar of fire. Do you know what you do at night when you're camping, when you're in a strange wilderness? What do you do? Typically, you light a fire. That fire may be to keep warm. That fire may be to cook something. But typically, when you're in an unknown area, maybe in the woods or in the wilderness place, when you're in an unknown area, especially those areas that are known for predators, you light a fire and you keep it burning. Why do you keep a fire lit? To keep predators away. Yeah. Now why do you think that God led the children of Israel by fire at night? God always works in symbols. If you don't believe me, read the book of Revelations. It's full of symbols. It's full of things. Even Jesus spoke in idioms and, and, and different things. And some will say he even spoke in riddles because it wasn't, it, sometimes it just did not make sense without the presence of God. But he led the children by a cloud in the day and by fire at night. Don't you know that we need the presence of the Lord as much in the nighttime as we do during the day? That 
that fire if we will stay in the presence of God. That fire will keep the predator away. That fire will keep us burning. That fire will feed us. That fire will do what man cannot do. The enemy will come creeping in like a thief. He'll come in on every aspect of your, of your environment. But when he sees that fire burning, when he sees that fire burning, it will let him know that fire, that power of the fire that's burning is more than I can even take. That fire scares me to my core. Don't you know that the presence of God, it scares the enemy to the very core? That's why he's wanting to pull you away from the presence of God. He's wanting to tug you away from your relationship and your fellowship with God. Because if he can pull you away from the presence of God, he's pulled you away from the fire that he cannot come close to. Psalm 16 and 11 says, Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. It says, In thy presence is fullness of joy. In thy presence. Yeah. In thy presence. Yeah. In thy presence. Yes. You can't find joy outside of the presence of God. You may think you can. You may say, oh, I'm happier than I've ever been. Give it a while. It'll drain. It will fade away. Because in thy presence is fullness of joy. It's not temporary. It's not partial. It is the fullness of joy. It amazes me how people just search for anything Everything and everyone under the sun to fulfill their joy. Life won't do it. Relationships won't do it. Money won't do it. The best health in the world won't do it. Government won't do it. Retirement won't do it. Food won't do it. Drugs won't do it. Alcohol won't do it. Nothing will fill the void like the presence of the Almighty God. In thy presence is fullness of joy. In thy presence. David said in Psalms 51 and 11, Take not thy presence away from me. David, in all of, of his his. He had faults. He was a mighty warrior of God, but he was flesh. He was human, and he had his faults. But the one thing David did understand, God, I cannot live without your presence. I cannot survive without your presence. Take not thy presence away from me. And many of us, many of the world, we're so quick, and, 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 and we are, are so quick to... Dismiss the presence of God. I don't know about you, but the reason I was late coming out here is because two times I had my Bible and I walked towards the door and something pulled me back in. And I just held my Bible and I was walking around in the office and I said, God, this is where I want to be. In your presence. I feel you so strong. God, there's nothing else that matters as long as I'm in the presence of the Almighty. Because in the presence of the Almighty, I find my joy. In the presence of the Almighty, I find my strength. In the presence of the Almighty, I find my wisdom. In the presence of the Almighty, I find my peace of mind. In in the presence of the Almighty, I find my endurance. In the presence of the Almighty, I find my liberty. The, the scripture said, who the Son sets free is free indeed. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And Satan will do anything and everything he can to pull you away from the presence of God. If he can lure you away from the presence of God, he's got you. Anything and everything he will use and he can use. It's all to remove you out of the presence of God. Wasn't it the prodigal son that when he was in the pig pen on his knees eating slop and corn husk 
He, he said he came to himself. I had it good in my father's house. See, he, he left the presence of the father. And he thought, hey, I'm going to live it up. I'm going to spend my inheritance. I'm going to be happy until he wasn't. Because he remembered how good he had it in the father's house. He remembered how good he had it in the presence of the father. He said, even the servants have it better. Acts 3 and 19 says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. You want to be refreshed, get in the presence of God. You want to be renewed, get in the presence of God. You want to be rekindled, get in the presence of, the, of God. You want to be refined, get in the presence of the Lord. You want to, to hear a fresh word of the Lord, get into the presence of God. You want to be healed from head to toe, get into the presence of God. You want deliverance from anything and everything, get into the presence of God. Yeah. The presence of God. We have said time and time again, if we're not allowed to to let the presence of God reign in his own house, yeah. lock the doors. Lock the doors cuz we otherwise it's just a gathering. Uh, otherwise we're just we're just um, coming together, chit-chatting, it's social hour. No, I love each and every one of you, and I love talking to you, but my main purpose of being here is to be in the presence of the Almighty. I, man cannot do what they can try. I can do what I can for you, but nothing will take the place of the presence of God. When we usher in the presence of God into his own house, we're throwing our hands up and we're saying, God, I surrender all. I surrender my worries. I surrender my fear. I surrender my agenda. I surrender my will. I surrender anything and everything that doesn't make sense to me. I surrender my chains. I surrender my children. I surrender my spouse, my loved ones. God, all I want is to be in your presence. Yes. What do you think we're going to do when we step through those pearly gates? We're going to reign in the presence of God forever. Yeah. Yeah. Forever. Yeah. Without end. With no gaps. We won't ever hunger. There won't ever be a shortage of the presence of God because we will be literally in the presence yeah. of God. There'll be no more worries. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more tears. There'll be no more sadness. There'll be no more what ifs. There will be no more enemy. Second Chronicles 5 and 13 says it came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one. See, there's something about the unity of the body of Christ. The unity of the body of Christ. When we all come together in one mind and in one accord, just like in, the, in, in Acts on the day of Pentecost, there's something to be said about coming into one mind and in one accord. Even here, they came into, uh, they were as one to make one sound. To be heard and praising and thanking the Lord. That's why it is so important that when we come together in the presence of God and we worship, that we be in one mind and in one accord. Don't look at what other people are doing. Don't worry about who's here and who's not here. Don't worry about this, that, or the other. Don't worry about who's coming in the back door. Don't worry about who's coming in the side door. The one thing that we should be doing is coming together in one mind and in one accord, lifting up one sound to the Lord with our voices, with our hearts, with our minds in unity, praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals and instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. 
that then, there's that word again, then, not before, but then, when they came together in one mind and in one accord, lifting up the name of the Most High, saying, He is good, His mercy endureth forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister yes. by reason of the cloud. Don't you know, we've said before, we have, we have spent days... With God just coming together and, and, and saying, God, what would you have us say to the people? What would you have us minister? What would you have us tell the people? And we make our notes. And sure, as I'm standing here on Sunday morning, God ups and turns the apple car and says, nope, you're going to speak on this. That's okay. Because we won't, we crave the presence of God. We crave the presence of God. Because in the presence of God, we find our answers. In the presence of God is where we find our peace. We find our joy. It's in the presence of God. It says, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. When did it stop being about God in his own house? When did we stop saying, okay, God, we're going to push your spirit to the side. We got a timetable to keep. We got an agenda. No, I don't want an agenda in, in the house of God. God, do what you want to do. If you want us to sing, sing. If you want us to preach, we'll preach. If you want us to lay hands on the sick, we'll lay hands on the sick. If you want us spread out at the altar, we'll do that too. But all we want to do is obey you. All we want to do is lift your name up. All we want to do is be in the presence of God. However we have to get there, we will do it because the presence of God is the anointing that breaks every yoke. Amen. It says so that the priest could not stand to minister. You know how many times I have prayed and said, God, let it fall. Yes. Let your glory fall. Yes. Let your glory cloud fall. Yes. So much and so thick and so heavy that we cannot even stand in your presence. Lord, that we can't even begin to use our own strength, our own ability, but we just fall to the ground in the presence of the Almighty because your glory is too, is too much for us. Your strength and your power, it, it just... It, we exalt it, God. And when we exalt you, it's less of us. Amen. There's been times, and I know that Shane can say this too, that when we feel the glory of God up here so strong that we can't even hardly stand, that we're praying for people. And God is dealing with us, showing us things. And we feel the presence of God. And it's all we can do to keep standing. That's the presence of God. We see all of these buildings go up. Buildings. Because in my mind, they're buildings unless the presence of God is there then that makes it the house of God. If the presence of God is not there, don't you label it the house of God. Don't you do him a disservice like that. Don't you lie to the people like that. Because where, where the spirit of the Lord is, that's where lives are changed. That's where we see things that otherwise we wouldn't see. We feel things that otherwise we would not feel. Because the presence of God in his own house is something to be reverenced. It's something to hunger and thirst after. I don't know about you, but I can remember there being such a hunger in people for the presence of God. And it seems like it's dwindling. It start, it's like sands in the hourglass. I've talked to 
with some people and they, they say, oh, I used to be so on fire for God. I have such a hunger for God. I read my Bible every single day. I fellowship with God every single day. I went to church. I did all of these different things. I had the zeal of God. And somehow, it's just not there anymore. Well, the Bible says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I will always be with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So what changed? It wasn't God. It was not God. You may say, I don't feel the same way about God. What if God said, I don't feel the same way about you? A lot of times we get angry with God because of things that man has done. Things that man has said. And God said, I didn't do that. I didn't say that. I, there was nothing about the cross that changed. So whatever it is, get it out. Because I'm still worthy of every praise. I'm still worthy of the glory of the cross. I'm still worthy of everything that's coming out of your mouth. That's the love of God. Yes. That is the love of God. When why it says that while we were yet sinners, he hung on that cross. He knew what a wretch we were. And he still said, I gotta do it. I gotta hang on this cross. My my hands have to be nailed to that cross. I have to die for my people. But I'm not gonna stay there. Because just as much as the presence of God is in the house of the Lord, the presence of God was on that cross. The presence of the Almighty was in that tomb. The presence of the Almighty is in your work day. The presence of the Almighty should be in your home, should be in the schoolhouse. It should be in the government. It should be in the White House. It should be at the governor's office. It should be down the street. It should be at the, the, the local grocery store. The presence of God should be everywhere you go. It's time we get back to the presence of God. You want to see a change in you, get in the presence of God. You want to see a change in your community, get back to the presence of God. You want to see a change in this country, get back to the presence of God. I said it before and I'll say it again. We can protest all we want to, but change begins in here. Change begins at these altars. Change begins when we humble ourselves. Didn't it say in, in Second Chronicles, I believe it was 2 Chronicles 7, 14, that if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, not the world. It says if my people, my people, if my people will humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face and pray, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. It's not going to change until we hit our knees in, in prayer. When we hit our knees and enter into the presence of God and say, God, before I can expect change out here, I need change in here. But I do believe there's an army rising up. Amen. There's an army rising up who's been on their knees before the Lord, who's put their face before God and said, God, hear the cries of your people. In your presence is where we need to be. In your presence is where we belong. In your presence is where we find answers. There is an army that is rising up. Yes. That is praying, seeking the Lord, and asking God for a turnaround. He's asking. There's an army asking God. Not my will, but thy will be done. Not my will. God, I know even on my best day, if I were to have an agenda in my day, I would mess it all up. If I had an agenda to how to run this ministry, I would surely fail. 
But God, when it's your house, when it's your agenda, when I take my hands off of it and say, God, not me, but you, that is when we succeed. That's when we get the victory. Because just like the children of Israel, God was leading them someplace that they knew not of. God was leading them by a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. You know that same cloud that offered light to the children of Israel when Pharaoh and his army was gaining ground on them. That same cloud that was, it said, luminous. It was lit for the children of Israel, completely blinded Pharaoh and his army. This same thing that is enlightening us is blinding the enemy. I'm going to say that again because I like that. The same thing that's enlightening us, showing us where to tread, where to go, is the same thing that is is blinding the enemy. It doesn't make sense. How can one thing produce two things? Well, it's because it's the presence of God. The presence of God went from before the people and said, I'm going to go separate my people from the enemy. They're going to keep walking because they know who I am. They're going to keep walking because they're trusting in me. But as for that enemy who thinks they're coming against my people, for for the enemy who thinks that they're almost closing in, I'm going to cause their eyes to be blinded. I'm going to cause the light for my children to be darkness for the world. There's something to be said about the glory cloud of the Lord. Our worship brings the glory cloud, which is the presence of the Almighty. And we say, well, the presence of God is not just in the church house. You're exactly right. The presence of God is anywhere that you want it to be. Anywhere where you invite him in. It could be on your best day on the top of of the highest mountain. You You may be happier than a lark and just loving life. The presence of God is still there. You're just not aware of it. The same presence that's on the highest peak of that mountain when you're just as happy is in the same lowest valley where you say, God, I don't know what to do. The presence of God is still there. The same God that's on the mountaintop is the same God that's in the valley. It's the same God who can bring you out. It's the same God. That presence of God is just as present on your best day as it is on your worst day. The presence of God is in the wilderness. The presence of God is in the fire. The presence of God is in the storm. It's in the lion's den. It was on the cross and it was in the tomb. And guess what? It's in each and every one of you. You just have to be aware of it. You just have to call on it. You just have to recognize it. Because when the presence of God is acknowledged... When the presence of God is acknowledged. Because remember, he said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Lo, I will be with you always. He's right here with us. But many times we push him to the side and say, I, I, don't, I don't have time for that today. I don't want the presence of God to override my will. I don't. I'm nervous about the presence of God. I'm scared about the presence of God. Whether you know it or not, you need that presence of God. You need that presence of God. There's been times in my life that I felt so low and and in such a dark place that I've told you before. I felt within my own self, God, if this is all there is, just take me out. Just let me leave this world because there's nothing. If there's all this, if this is all that there is, then life is not worth living. But God quickly showed me I'm the same God in this case as I was when you were just as happy as the world. I do not change. 
and know there is this is not all that is left of me. I got so much more, but you've got to put your focus in me. You've got to call on me. You've got to put me first in your life. You've got to push out all the noise. You've got to push out all the distractions, and you've got to put me first. It was the presence of God that ushered in the Hebrew boys into that fiery furnace. And while they were walking around, the very one that threw them in the fire looked and said, Didn't we throw three men in the fire? Because I see four, and one likened to the Son of Man. See, the, the very presence of God was walking around Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego right in the, the very flames of the fire. And they didn't get burned. They didn't even smell like smoke. The presence of God was in the lion's den, holding those lion's mouths shut. In fact, I, I would even go as far to say that he removed the hunger for man out of their, out of their, their very being. Because if you know anything about lions, they're meat eaters. And wasn't it when they got Daniel out and they threw the people in, they didn't hold back. Now you tell me that wasn't the presence of God. You tell me that God can't do it. You tell me that God's not fighting your battles. You tell me that God's not surrounding you. You tell me that God's not preparing this place. Because he is. He is. He's preparing. He, he has been preparing this place since the first brick was laid. Play, play my weapon. Every head bowed and every eye closed.